محمد وعلي محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربنا واجعلنا مسلمين لك ومن ذريتنا ومن ذريتنا أمة مسلمة وأرنا مناسكنا وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم صدق الله العلي العظيم My topic tonight is parenting toward an independent and righteous offspring. There are two kinds of livings, brothers and sisters. One kind, this is according to the scholars and philosophers, when they describe life. They say the first life is the actual life. The life or the living thing or the objects that exist have two forms. The first form is the actual existence. For example, this microphone, this podium, the people that I see. Those that I see, they have actuality. They have existence, a real existence right now. And there is another form of existence, which is a potential existence an existence that later on will flourish. How? Imagine a seed of an apple. This seed of an apple by itself right now is a seed. However, potentially, if the right condition prevail, this seed will be transformed to an apple a tree. The same thing you can say about a seed of a date. When the right condition prevail, by now, it's a seed, only a tiny little seed that you throw away. But assume the right condition prevail, you take the seed and you plant it in a fertile land, you give it water, you give it fertilizer, you remove the weeds from it and the pests from it, and there is a sunlight that is beaming on, potentially this seed will be changing to a tree, of, you know, palm of date or an apple a tree. The same thing with a sperm. This sperm can potentially be a human being. And this human being can turn to be a great scientist, can be a great state leader, can be a superstar. You can imagine whatever you would imagine. Eventually, there are those two kinds of existence. One is the actual existence, and the other one is the potential existence. Now, those philosophers and scholars divide, hum divide living things based on those two criteria. They say the majority of living things, especially animals, 
they have this actual existence. They are brought to this world, they live this world, they live in this world, and live as they are brought to. Nothing changed. They move through a destiny that had been prescribed for them. They never deviate from, you know, from what has been described to them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ما من دابة إلا هو آخذ بناصيتها All of those animals, God has taken their control. From the minute that they come until the last minute that they depart, they stay as they are. All animals like this. For example, I remember when we were kids at the school, they used to teach us this story about a donkey, and this is taken from the Arabic version of Kalilo Adimna. It says that a donkey used to live, you know, as a donkey. Eventually died again as a donkey. So the animals took him, you know, made a funeral and a procession for him. As they are carrying him, they were saying this poetry in Arabic, saying, لا جعل الله له قرارا عاش حمارا he lived like a donkey and died like a donkey. Nothing has changed. Exactly the same thing. This is the actual existence. But on the other side, there is another kind of living thing. Hopefully it is a human being that can change, that has a potential existence. It is brought to this world as a human being. But if the right condition prevails, it becomes a scholar. It becomes scientist. It can, manuf can, can manufacture a spacecraft called Voyager that can you know, travel a distance over 12 billion miles. Have you heard of this? Voyager has it traveled a distance over 12 billion miles from our planet. I think it has been launched back in the 70s, 76, 77. This how far it has gotten. Who has built this? Who has made it? A human being. Who started from what? From a single sperm, a single seed. The same human being can be a greater prophet, can be an infallible, can be rahmatan lil alameen, can be a mercy toward entire humanity, or can even devalue, can change to be the worst animal on the face of the planet can be the worst criminal who can kill at one second more than 200,000 people. You know, when the nuclear bomb, when the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, within a you know, few minutes, 200,000 people perished, died. Who has made the bomb? Who has dropped the bomb? Again, it's a human being. But do you see the difference? Now, the question, how someone can rise, can use this potential existence, can rise to that level of a prophethood, or can descend to the level of worse than an animal. Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, has a beautiful word. He says, You know, I am not saying the exact words, maybe there is a little changes. That God has created angels to, from total rationality and intellect. And have instilled in the baha'im, in the animals, have instilled the propensity, the instinct. Now, it says, Made. The, you know, intellect and the instinct all mixed and give it to human being. فَمَنْ غَلَبَ عَقْلُهُ غَرِيزَتُهُ فَهُوَ غَرِيزَتَهُ فَهُوَ أَعْلَى مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ وَمَنْ غَلَبَتْ غَرِيزَتُهُ عَقْلَهُ فَهُوَ أَدْنَى مِنَ الْبَهَائِمِ Someone whose mind and whose intellect can overcome his instinct and his desire, he's better than the angels. And someone who's, no, just the other way, his instinct, his desire overcome his intellect and his mind, he becomes worse than the animal. Now the question, how do we reach this level? Simple. It is by 
many factors, but most important part, most important factor is the parenting. It is the right parenting that give, you know, such kind of individual. For example, the Prophet Ibrahim, Ibrahim as I recited at the beginning of the ayah, at the lecture, it says, Rabbana, Rabbana ja'alna muslimayn laka wa min dhurriyatina ummatan muslima. Make from our progeny a good, faithful, and submissive nation toward you. This is a prayer of Ibrahim. Meaning that the parent, well, by dua only we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us such wonderful children, such a beautiful offsprings, would not help. It has to be associated with the right parenting. It is the parenting again that can make someone infallible, great, or can bring it down. For example, when you look at the household of Fatima alayhi salam, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. They have noticed that they have two ma'soom, two infallibles, and two great personalities like Zainab and Umm Kulthum. Those two great personalities, Zainab, who not only was the ambassador of the message of Imam Hussein after the day of Ashura, despite the hardships, despite the agony, despite the grief, despite the disaster that she was going through, yet she was the caretaker of the message of Abi Abdullah al Hussein and the message of Ashura. If, we're, if Zainab were not available, if Zainab did not exist today after so many years, so many centuries, we are not sitting here and commemorating the memory of Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein would have been considered a bandit who came and revolted against the just Khalifa and was executed, was killed. No one would have heard about Imam Hussein. We heard now and we are commemorating the memory of Imam Hussein due to the struggles of Zainab. Who has created Zainab? How did she become the Zainab that, you know, that we know? The Zainab with all her qualities. History tell us what Fatima and Ali ibn Abi Talib used to do for them. It is narrated that on every Thursday, Fatima would make her children sleep in the afternoon. At noon, when they had their lunch, they would, she would make them sleep for a couple hours. Why? So on Thursday night, on the eve of a Friday, they get up and see their parents when they perform their prayers and supplications. This is the reason, brothers and sisters. This is how Fatima have made, you know, those children. This is it. Today, we are commemorating, in our tradition, of course, the legacy of Al-Qasim ibn al-Hassan. Last night, our great scholar, our respected scholar, Dr. Taqi, talked about him. How did Al-Qasim, someone at age of 13, when his, when his uncle asked him, how do you feel about death? He tells him, sweeter than honey in your way. Who have taught him this? It had been taught him by, you know, by the right, appropriate parenting. Brothers and sisters, parenting is not only we provide for our children. We fill our stomach and make them wear the best outfit or send them for the best vacations or send them to an excellent school that they teach them math and English and biology and you know, the rest of the subjects. Parenting, it is the most difficult, the most challenging thing. Why? Because we want to make the best, the most useful member in society. The most useful person in society does not come only by physical strength, by muscle strength. He has to have the mental ability. His spirit and his mind should be you know, should be well taken care of, should be nourished. Not only his ability, his physical ability. Unfortunately, many of us, we bog down and we get so concerned about what we feed our children. When we go to the supermarket, for example, or we want to buy something to eat, we look through the ingredients. 
First, we check the calories, we check the fatty acid, we check the sugar level, we check all of those. Once we make sure 100% that this is healthy, then we give it to the children or we eat. But what do they watch on TV? What do they see, for example, at the school? What do they communicate with the rest of the, you know, their colleagues at the school? We care less. Al-Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam has a beautiful word. He said, عَجِبْتُ لِمَنْ يَتَفَكَّرُ فِي مَأْكُولِهِ وَلَا يَتَفَكَّرُ فِي مَعْقُولِهِ فَيُجَنِّبُ بَطْنَهُ مَا يُؤْذِيهِ وَيُودِعُ صَدْرَهُ مَا يُرْدِيهِ He said, I wonder about someone who cares so much about what he eats. You tell him, eat buklawa, no, 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 I, you know, my, my, my cholesterol is high. Eat this, no, 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 you know, I have a sugar of blood, my sugar of blood, I'm type E, to type, type 2, type 1, you know, diabetes, and things like that. But when it comes to, you know, bad thoughts, when it comes to ill ideology, we care less about them. We allow our children to get it and to, you know, to be happy about it. Imam Al-Hasan says, the one that you are avoiding, the food that you are avoiding, maybe it wouldn't hurt your stomach. But when you let a bad information, a terrible, indecent information, or piece of knowledge in the mind, in the heart of you, that will kill you. That will make you a deviant person. So parenting, brothers and sisters, is not only how you deal with them, rather how you make them eventually to become a useful and faithful person in society. Again, my topic was how to make them independent and righteous. At the same time that they reach independence, they become righteous and faithful. Not by coercion, not by force, rather by persuasion, by convincing. How would you convince, you know, the children? By the way, if you look at the entire, you know, animal strata, animal race, you see that a human being is considered to be the weakest of all living things in terms of its physical ability. Look at all animals. Within a couple months from their birth, they walk, they run, they hunt, they run away from the hunters, they become self-reliant and independent. But for a human being, take such a long time, years, until they walk, then they go to school, then they learn words, until they become fully independent from their parents. How long will it take? Some of us, maybe 45 years. You know, <laughs> is still dependent on his parents. You know, so this is the something peculiar about a human being. At the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instilled in the human this is spirit for independence, for a spirit of, of being self-reliant. You can see it in those little toddlers. Once they start using the first word, or once they start standing up on their feet, or walk, or get potty trained, you see that they are so elated, so happy. Why? because now they can do it independently. They, they have recognized self. They have found that they can be, you know, an independent person. This is natural. It is instilled in every single human being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instilled this fact in it. Now there are two kinds of people or two kinds of children, let's say. The first type of children are those who are so dependent on others so dependent on parents. Even the, the water, the cup of water should be served to their beds. Their parents, unfortunately, mother and father have been transformed to be maids and servants, an ATM machine. Whenever they want money, there is the money. Whenever they want something, right there. From feeding them, to dressing them, to showering them, to doing everything for them, cleaning their rooms, they become all reliant on others. And unfortunately, brothers and sisters, the biggest share of a blame goes to the parents themselves. It is the father, it is the mother who did not teach the children or did not let them feel that at one point it is their responsibility. And making the father or the mother your maid 
and your serv servants will make you disgraceful. We have a word in Arabic called aq, aq al Imagine the hadith says, God will curse this kind of parent that make, that help the child become disgraceful. Meaning that it is not only the child that will be held responsible. The parents also are accountable. They are also held complicit with him, who have been helping him to become, you know, reliant on them and using them in this way. So this is one type of, you know, children, one type of people of society, those kind of parents, not only they are hurting this child, you know, in his age, when he grows and becomes adult in the society, also he becomes reliant. Unfortunately, nowadays, when you look at many or some, let's, name, let's not say many, some of the Arabic society, especially those who are rich and wealthy, they're always reliant on others. You go, you see that they are maybe one quarter of the total population. The rest of the population are expats, people who have come from different parts of the world. Why? To serve them. In terms of education, they are the ones who educate them. They are the ones who provide them service. They are the ones who fly their airplanes. They are the ones who clean their homes and you know, clean their streets and do everything. While they are all you know, relying on others. Where did this come from? From being spoiled. When you spoil them too much. When they have wealth and they don't know what to do with it and sitting idle, eventually they rely on others. This is one bad example. The other example, brothers and sisters, when someone who becomes fully independent, fully self-reliant, the child from the beginning doesn't allow his parent to take part in anything. He wants to do everything by himself. Anything that comes to his mind, he wants to do. With the help of his parents, they tell, yes, you know, he has to do, you know, he has to find out his way. He's the one who will decide for his life. Let him experiment. Do the, you know, let him explore and find out under the guise of self-experimentation, he does his adventures. Well, obviously, such kind of person also will run into trouble, will harass others, will abuse others, will make so many problems without any guidance. The, this kind of person will be cursed by others, will be, you know, people will criticize his parents. There is a narration from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. Says that a man asked the Prophet, ma haqqul ab, what is the, you know, the right of the father or the parents in this way? He told him, first of all, meaning the child should hold the, the, the following respect to his parents. Allah yusammihi bismi. First of all, you should not name him. You know, he should not name his dad or mom by their names. He, wouldn't, he shouldn't say Muhammad or Fatima. He have to call dad and mom. Unfortunately, brothers and sisters, in this country, I have seen many families. They, they help. They, they would welcome their children to use, you know, their first name when they call them. It is narrated that when the message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to the Muslims to tell them, do not call the Prophet by his name. Rather say, Ya Rasulullah. At that time, Fatima, his daughter, started calling him Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet went and told her, Fatima, why do you call me Rasulullah? I am your father. I would love to hear the word Ya Aba. I want to hear, you know, you're, you're calling me daddy, calling me father. She said, because of the mandate in the Holy Quran, he said, Fatima, this mandate is not for you. It is for those impolite Arabs, those nomads who don't know what to say. They call me by, the na by my name. This message is for them, not for you. You should call me Ya Aba. So here the Prophet, peace be upon him, is telling this man, is saying that the first thing he should not call you by your name. You should not walk before him. You know, when you walk, the children either they should walk with you or a little bit, you know, one step farther, one step in the back and would not sit 
where you are going to sit, they go in. Sit here is teaching us the proper way of conducting self with the parents. And eventually, here is my point. Would not make others curse their parents. How? When I drive crazily, recklessly, okay? I cut this guy out and I move to this, you know, to the, and drive dangerously. What people would say, may Allah curse your parents. Here, the Prophet, peace be upon him, saying, Don't make something, some wrongdoing that people curse your parents. Here is being reckless. Someone who's always want to be self-independent and self-reliant without taking the guide of parents, eventually will become an arrogant person. A dictator would not listen, would not have any consultants, would not have any friends. Here Al-Imam alayhi salam, Amir al-Mu'mineen says, Man istabadda bi ra'ihi halak. Someone who always put only his thought in his mind without listening to others. This man will die. This one will be, you know, in a trouble, will vanish. وَمَنْ شَاوَرَ النَّاسِ شَاوَرَهُمْ بِعْقُولِهِمْ when I consult with others, I am getting two thoughts. I am getting three thoughts. The more thoughts you get, the more thinking you, you get, the better it is. This is the idea. So those are the two types of extremes. The good one is the one that children are raised independent, independently, but under the patronage of the parents, under the guidance of the parents. Parents always would watch them. Okay, what are those, you know, steps toward independence? Again, I have collected a few of them. I would say after your big and loud salawat. <laughs> the first step, of brothers and sisters, it has to do with us. Remember last night when we talked about self-control? It has to do with parents' self-control. I should know who I am. I should know what I say in front of my kids. I should know how I behave. I should have control over myself. Look how Quran, you see the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are so specific, so detailed oriented. When he talks about children and family, what he says, how to avoid them, the hellfire. He wouldn't go and say he preach to children and make them avoid, you know, the hellfire. It says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum naran wa quduha al-nasu al-hijara. First, avoid it yourself. Second, let your, you know, children and your family avoid it. First, I should adopt the system. I should, not only I preach, I also practice. Not only I talk the talk, Rather, I have to walk the walk as well. I have to control myself. If I cannot control myself, would I be able to control others? Would I be able to control the bad mouth of a child that have learned the same word from me myself that I have taught him? Obviously not. I have to start with myself, especially anger, brothers and sisters. We talked about it last night. You know, the biggest challenge to Muslim families, especially in, to our homelands, I'm not talking here probably, but in our ha homeland is the family violence. The discord within the family, the husband and wife are not in a good term with each other. For a tiny little, you know, pity thing, they fight, they physically fight sometimes, they cause a trouble. This is all reflected bad on the children, studies, Studies have shown, this study by University College of London, it says that those children who are exposed to high level of family violence and discord experience physical, you know, and, and, you know, who, and, and, and have experienced physical abuse, family violence within the, within the family, they share a pattern of a brain reactivity similar to those Soldiers in combat. You know, how a soldier, when he gets tense in a combat fighting the enemy, how he becomes, you know, all tense and just ready to shoot and kill. This is how a child be develops, his brain gets developed in the 
you know, in a, in a family that has been swamped by family abuse and physical abuse and, and, and physical violence. It says that this definitely will affect the brain development. Their brain will not develop, you know, in a way that it's supposed to be. Eventually they turn to be antisocial. They become either depressing, you know, you know have depression, or antisocial, or eventually violent. Why? Due to the scene of violence that they see. You have to watch. The parents, the father, the mother, number one, should put the family interest before their interest. They should not sacrifice the children, the family, for their own desire and for their own interest. You wonder how Fatima and Umm Kulthum and Hassan and Hussein were raised? Look at Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatima. Look at, look at what Fatima is telling her, you know, her husband. He, she tells her husband, Ya ibn al-am, ma ahedtani kathibatan wala khaina, wala khalaftuka mundu aashartuk. She's telling him that, I have never disobeyed you, not even a single time. History does not tell us one day that Fatima has requested anything from Ali ibn Abi Talib. Not even a single thing. Always have put, you know, the family interest, the interest of the children in her thoughts, in her, eye, in her, in her eyes. The same thing with Ali ibn Abi Talib. Never sacrificed the family for his own desires. This is how you want to be, you know. When there is harmony between husbands and wife, that again will be reflected on the children. This is all coming from what? From self-control, from anger management. You have to manage your anger. You have to relax. I will give you the best example. Don't we say that the Prophet is rahmatan lil alameen? He's the mercy for the humanities. Among the wives of the Prophet, they were some who would conspire against him, who will cause headache for him. And this is a testimony in the Quran, in the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acknowledged this. It says, وَإِن تَظَاهَرَ عَلَيْهِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ مَوْلَاهُ وَجِبْرِيلُ وَصَالِحُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ He said, if they conspire against you, referring to certain wives of the Prophet, imagine what kind of terrible thing they have done. Yet, History doesn't tell us once, not even once, that the Prophet has yelled, screamed as his wife, let alone he have been, you know, physically abusing his wife. Always dealing with them in a best way, in a best mode possible. This is our role model, brothers and sisters. This is that we need to learn. When it comes to a child, whatever he does, violence is not the answer. You cannot be violent with him. You cannot bring him down with force. A man came to an Imam, Abil Hassan Musa ibn Ja'far, al Imam al Kadhim alayhi salam, told him, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He said that I complained about my son and told the Imam, Teach me, what should I do with this son? He says that, La tadribu. Number one, you should not hit him. Wahjurhu. At worst, abandon him. Don't talk to him, sanction him, boycott him. Put him in a room and say, I'm not talking to you for a while. Then he immediately says, Wala tutil. Don't even give it you know, too much time. One day, few hours, maximum two days, don't talk to your son. But eventually you have to come back and mend the, bridge, the bridges. Reconnect with your children. So number one, brothers and sisters, it is really the emotions. Unfortunately, sometimes we tell the child that that's enough. You brought me to the brink of, you know, eruption. Telling whom? A five, six years old baby. You know, unfortunately, we're all accomplices. You know, we, we're all complicit of this kind of behavior. What it tells us is that basically we have taken our emotion and given it to the hand and control of our baby. You know, the remote control of our emotion at the hand of this little baby. He can play with us. He can make us angry or happy in a split of a second. While we have to be, you know, tranquil, calm, and, you know, be careful. When we say self-control, before you do anything, think of the consequences. We have to take responsibility of the actions that we do 
and their consequences. Always think, what are the consequences when I, for example, hit this child or do something negative? What will happen? Wouldn't they run away from the home? Wouldn't they do certain things then? I always have to check the consequences before I do anything. Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam again, sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Has a beautiful word. He says, Al-Hiddatu Darbun min al junun Being tough and showing abuse is kind of craziness. One mode of a craziness. Wasahibuha yendam. Later, he will show remorse. He will feel sorry. If fa'illam yandam fa'jununuhu mustahkam. If this guy, after committing what he did, would not even feel remorse, then this man, his craziness is formidable. Then he has to check with a psychiatrist that there is something wrong with me, that I become so abusive with the family, with the children. So this is the, you know, first choice. The first criteria is to have self-control and we should check ourselves before we check our children. The second one, brothers and sisters, is to give them the right of choice. You see, every human being, and that's including the bad people, including the criminals, would like their children to be righteous, to be good children, to be behaving. But good is relative. Sometimes to mean good, meaning to be calm all the way, to be quiet all the way, does not do anything. This is to me, is a good, you know, this is the term, this is the definition of good to me is when someone is, when my child is completely quiet. This is not the proper way, brothers and sisters. We would like people to be good on our own term. In reality, they have a choice themselves. They are the ones who make a choice. They are the one who would like to be independent, even the little child. They want to feel at one point that they have the right to do something. If we want to apply our goodness, the definition of goodness to them, and we want them only to be exactly what we want, there are only two choices. Either they become fully obedient and reliant on us and cannot do anything later on, which is something bad, or they become rebellious. You know, eventually they give up. Eventually they say, the hell with this family. How much I am spending my time? with the parents who want me to do this, to eat this food only, or to, to wear this attire, or to wear this kind of shoe, or go to this kind of a school. That's it, it is too much. Although, this is universal, brothers and sisters. Everybody would like to, be his child, to see his children are go, doing, doing well, and learning good. Yet, we have to give them some choice. Probably some of you have seen this commercial that, um, it shows that the, 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 the father is sitting, you know, watching TV and all of a sudden the mom comes from, you know, from shopping, from wherever. And he asks her, what's, you know, what's for dinner today? And she keeps talking and talking and talking. And wawaila, if the ladies start talking, you know, they never stop. So he grabbed the remote control and push fast forward until he hears the word turkey. At that time he stopped. You know, he's just interested to hear the what's for dinner. And she keeps talking and talking. And then this commercial ends and then another one starts right away where the dad is trying to sneak from, you know, from the back door where having, you know, the golf club in his hand and the mom, you know, catches him. She grabs the remote control, points at, at him and, you know, flip the channel. And all of a sudden, to his surprise, he's washing dishes. What this is telling is that this commercial is trying to say that we would love to see people act, you know, according to our own thoughts, according to our own desires. But in reality, they cannot. Sometimes you have to make children or to accept the fact that the children will disagree with you. You know, give them the choice. Make them able sometimes to make a choice for themselves. If you give them allowance, don't ask them what to buy in it. Let them make the choice of buying their own, you know, desired game, for example, desired toy. 
Don't force them exactly you have to do this and this. Learn how to disagree with the child. When you disagree with him, teach him how he disagree respectfully with you. But teach him why and how. For what reason he should disagree. And how he should disagree. You see, brothers and sisters, unfortunately, back in our homeland, I have seen the education system. I have seen the education system there and the education system here. There, when they teach the child, when they teach the children, there are two kinds of teaching, by the way. The first one, when they think that this guy is a CD. So they add all kind of information to this person, you know? Learn this data, learn this information, learn this kind of river, know this geographic location, know the mountain, know, learn X, Y, without really comprehending why. You know, he just becomes a big CD. Whenever they want to get the extract the information, he's like a parrot repeating things. But why, why should he know, for example, this river is important to learn? He has no idea. You see, this kind of Teaching is an abusive teaching. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this, but in a different way. It says, التورات, Let me recite the ayah. التورات, it said those people who were taken Torah, Torah was full of a brightness and guidance. Yet, they did not understand the spirit of the message. What they did, they literally only learned the words without really digging and learning the spirit of the message. So this kind of teaching, we change the child to a parent. You know, the father said so, you have to believe it. The father, the mother have done this, you have to learn it. While we don't leave any room for analysis, only piling or formation, would be at the expense of analysis. The child will cannot analyze anymore. Have you seen those big computers? I, you know, I'm literate, I'm illiterate about the computers, but I know one thing. You have a storage memory and you have a processor. The more you add to the storage, to the memory, the less powerful the processor becomes. You know, the processing system cannot process all the data. Why? Because you have filled it fully, you know, overstaffed it with information that cannot process those information. The same thing with the child. The child, when you talk to him, he should know why. When you perform the prayer, he should know why he's praying with you. When you tell your little girl, seven years old or eight years old, wearing hijab, you need to tell her the beauty of hijab. You need to tell them the beauty of fasting, not only by forcing them, you know, to do this or making them imitate. The other way of teaching is when you allow, allow them to analyze. First, let them listen, then explain things to them. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a, a beautiful verse that our dear brother Khalid have said. They listen, they process, they analyze, then they choose the best way. Then they choose the best words. This is how a child should be. You should not only force him to learn, you know, or coercing him with so many ideas, with so many words that he has no idea why, for example, he's a prey. Once he's detaching from you, once he leaves you, he abandons the praying. Why? Because he doesn't know why. For what's, what's the reason he has been praying? You see, brothers and sisters, there are two qualities within any child. Two great equalities that we as parents have to take, you know, responsibility and exploit them. Number one, any child always consciously or unconsciously after a role model, after a hero. Tell a child, four years old, five years old, who's your hero? Would tell you the soldier, would tell you a police officer. Why? This is this instinct is within them, inherently within them. They're always in search of a role model. This is number one. Second, they have an excellent photographic memory. Whatever you do, they imitate it. They learn it. Even according to a special study, it says that even the smile of a toddler, let's say six months old, 
seven months old baby who smiles. They say this smile is not reflection of happiness. Rather, he's imitating his parents. The facial expression of his mom, of his dad, he's learning and he's repeating it. This is how much, you know, photographic memory and imitating ability they have. Utilize those two to become a role model for them, to explain the good things for them. You see Hassan and Hussein when they were children, Imam Hassan and Hussein, Fatima al Zahra and Ali ibn Abi Talib never forced them, for example, to perform their prayers or to be fasting. Yet, history tells us the Imams, those two Imams, Hassan and Hussein, were fasting with their parents, you know, for those three days. Remember in Surah Al Insan, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا Those are three days that they have spent observing fasting. Among them were Hassan and Hussein. They were six years old and seven years old, you know, children. How did they observe this fasting? Was it by force? Did Ali ibn Abi Talib coerce them, force them to do this? Or they have been inspired. They have learned, they have seen their parents, what they do. I will give you a, a beautiful story to see the extent why we have noticed Imam Hussein with so much sacrifice. Why we have seen such an immaculate person like Imam Hassan? Look at this story. It is Imam Hassan who narrates. He said that one day in the middle of night, I wake up and I saw Fatima al-Zahra. My mother is praying. She's standing up in her mihrab and praying. He says, مَا رَأَيْتُ أَعْبَدَ مِنْ أُمِّي فَاطِمَةً إنها كانت تقف في مصلاها للصلاة وما كانت تنفتل عن صلاتها حتى تتورم قدماها وكانت تدعو للمؤمنين والمؤمنات ولا تدعو لنفسها فأقول أماه فاطمة هل لا دعوت لنفسك فتقول بني حسن الجار ثم الدار Look at the beautiful words. He said that I see my mom stands up for hours. She performs her prayers. She supplicates. And despite the fact that her legs, her feet are swollen, for hours she performs the prayers. And I notice in her prayer, in her qunut, she mentions every Muslim. All the mu'mineen, all the mu'minat, she prays for them. But she doesn't mention her name. I tell her, Mom, Fatima, why don't you mention your name at the end? You have a prayed for everyone. Why didn't you pray for yourself? She looks at me and tells me, Mom, first we pray for the neighbor, then we pray for ourselves. Look at how many lessons Fatima teach them. Number one, she teaches them a prayer. Second, she teaches them prayer in the heart of night. Teach them sincerity, not a show off. Not only in front of people how they pray. It's between them and their Lord in the darkness, in the middle of darkness of the night. She tells them how to be socially responsible when she prays for the, you know, for the neighbors. And most importantly, she shows them how to be, you know, sacrificing. How you would sacrifice where you pray for others completely and you don't pray for yourself. This is the element of sacrifice. You see how now you wonder why Imam Hussein alayhi salam has sacrificed himself or Fatim or, or Zainab alayhi salam have sacrificed, has went through all this sacrifice because they were all getting those lessons, the practical lessons. They were all been inspired to see those things and to learn from them. Eventually, these are the second, you know, criteria. I need to move it quickly, inshallah. The third one, brothers and sisters, let them struggle. Again, the same topic, spoiling them for, you know, rushing to their aid, for their homework, for their task, for, you know, duty, for cooking an egg, doing something, always rushing to them. This will, you know, will, will do disservice to them. You need to let them stand up on their feet eventually. Let them go. Those who can afford, send your children to far away, remote places. Let them go to, you know, a poor neighborhood. Let them see 
how difficult life is there. I remember once we went to Iraq and they were among the companions that came with us. A few, you know, families who were, you know, affluent families, wealthy families, made their children see the agonies of others. See how others would suffer. Make them feel this. Leave them. Send them somewhere. Let them stay for a while to stand up on their feet, to see the hardship of life of brothers and sisters. And fortunately, which is fortunate that we live in this country, and alhamdulillah, everything is affordable. Everything is nice. And, you know, we can attain it. There is no difficulty in that. But that becomes unfortunate when we get away with it. We think that easy life always stays like this. We have to teach the children that sometimes there is a hardship. Let them struggle. Let them figure out by themselves. And eventually, brothers and sisters, the last thing that I will conclude with this, help them express their religious identities. We are Muslims in this country, despite the fact that we are Americans. Yet, we should not lose this identity, brothers and sisters. Just, you know, a few minutes ago, I was on the phone with a lady who called me and told me that my daughter goes to the high school. She would love to wear hijab, but she's embarrassed because people laugh at her. I told her sister, this is mandated by Allah. Let, her, let them laugh at her. How many times they want to laugh at her? 10 times? 20 times? Eventually they stop. Why would, because of, you know, few people would make fun of you, would love to laugh at you, you, you know, stop wearing what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mandated upon you. I ask you questions. The same Westerners, when they come to our holy lands, when they come to our lands, would they wear our own attire? Or they keep their own attire? They still wear the mini jobs and the mini skirts and walk in the streets. Which one? Why, when they come to our land, still they do the same thing, you know? And they're very proud and happy about it. When you tell them, tell you, you know, I am Westerner. I don't have to abide by your rules. But when we are here, when we live in their country, which is our country at the same time, we have to make it, you know, because, because their eyes, for example, see things are funny and they, you know, they don't appreciate it. Let them not appreciate it for many years. You have to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciate you. Make them, your children, children emphasize the fact on them that you are a Muslim. Don't be ashamed of your attire. Don't be ashamed for crying for Imam Hussein. Don't be ashamed at the time of the prayer, you stop your car or get out of your classroom, go to the grass and perform your prayers. There is nothing wrong with, about this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to do this. I remember when I was a student here in this country, maybe once in a while, once in a blue moon, I would see one, you know, single lady with a hijab. Nowadays, alhamdulillah, you go everywhere. You go to the market, you go to the bank, you go to the universities. MashaAllah, plenty of people, plenty of sisters are wearing hijab. If each of one of them would say, I would not wear hijab, because people would laugh at me, because, you know, it's, I feel strange within people, then we haven't reached this, you know, this stage. Again, we would be exactly the same way as we used to be. No one would care to wear hijab. Rather, we have to emphasize those facts on our children. We should make them proud. We should make them proud when they declare that they are Muslim and they believe in their religion that this is the true path that they are taking. Today, brothers and sisters, again, as I have said, in our country, in our homeland, in Iraq, they commemorate the legacy of Al-Qasim ibn al-Hassan. Al-Qasim was 13 years old boy who had become an orphan of Al-Imam Al-Hassan alayhi salam. Moved to Karbala with his uncle, with his family. And on the night of the battle with Imam Hussein, when the Imam was describing the whole scene tomorrow and telling his friends and the companions what will happen to them, he said that all of you will be perished. All of you will be killed and will be eradicated. No one will stay. Al-Qasim went and said, Ya'am, and I am among them as well. 
I am also will be dead. People will kill me. The Imam told him, wanted to feel his feelings. Says, وَكَيْفَ الْمَوْتُ عِنْدَكَ How do you feel about death, Father? Ya Qasim. He said, وَاللَّهِ فِي نُصْرَتِكَ أَحْلَى مِنَ الْعَسَلِ In your way, dying, in your way, in your assistance, it is sweeter than honey. This is the words of Al Qasim. Imam told him, yes, tomorrow also you will be killed. On the battle, on the moment of the battle, and the noon of Ashura, Al Qasim comes out of the khaymah, from the tent. His mother has made him wear the attire of his father, Al Imam Al Hassan, and brought him close to Al Imam Al Hussein. Once the Imam Hussein noticed him, he started crying. He, he hugs Al Qasim and both keep crying and crying and weeping. Then he tells him, are you going for death? He said, why wouldn't I go for death, Ya Amma, where I see you alone here among those infidels. They are all killing you and surrounding you. I have to fight with them. He tells him, okay, go and say goodbye to your mom. He goes back and say goodbye to his mom. Again, he goes to his aunt. When his aunt Zainab hugs him, she keeps kissing him and hugging him and tell him, Qasim, I want one thing, keep in mind one thing. Tell when you will be dead, when you will be dying, you will see my mother Fatima al Zahra. Tell Fatima that your daughter is alone in the desert of Karbala. She has lost all her brothers. She has lost all her companions. Al Qasim goes to the battle. As he fights, he's only a 13 years old man. He says, "Intun kuruni fa'ana najlul Hasan, sabt al Nabi al Mustafa wal Mu'taman, had al Hussein kal Asir al Murtahan, bayna unas la suqu sawb al Muzun." He keeps fighting. He kill, kills more than 30 of the warriors. Eventually, Amr ibn Sa'd al-Azdi was standing by. He hits him right on his head. He falls on the ground and says, Assalamu alayka ya Amma. Imam Hussein rushed to him. People would notice what the Imam does. When the Imam comes down, he put his chest and his face right on the face and chest of Al-Qasim. He carries Qasim to the tent. As he walks before him, Ali al-Akbar was, was dead. He lies Al-Qasim next to Ali al-Akbar. On one eye, he watches Al-Qasim. On the other eye, he watches Ali al-Akbar and weeps. All of a sudden, Zainab comes from behind and tells him, Ya Akhi, brother, move, because the mother of Qasim and mother of Ali al-Akbar would not, would like to come and grieve them. But they are embarrassed in front of you. Al Hussein leaves, and those two mothers come inside the tent. The mother of Al Qasim, the first thing that she does, she stains her hair by the blood of her, her son. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Al Ali al Azim, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Wa ala al arwah alati hallat bi finaik. Wa ana khat bi rahlik. عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم Everybody. السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين ورحمة الله وبركاته